All right, go ahead and feel free to stop me anywhere through the lecture. Um, you're the only one right now. <laughs> well, okay, I think we ended off here. So the genetic code. We talked about um, transcription, translation, right? Transcription originates inside the nucleus of eukaryotes. Uh, bacteria are a little different. Again, they can perform transcription and translation at the same time, whereas eukaryotes separate it, right? So eukaryotes need to have uh, transcription, which is DNA to RNA inside of the nucleus. Then that RNA can travel outside of the nucleus to perform translation um, with a ribosome, okay? So again, eukaryotes, uh, transcription, translation is separated by, this, uh, by the nucleus and the nuclear envelope. Uh, uh, prokaryotes or bacteria um, can perform transcription, translation at the same time, okay? Um, and again, transcription and translation. Uh, transcription is going to be DNA to RNA. Remember, um, thymine is going to be converted into uracil for RNA. Remember, we talked about RNA is red in uh, triplets. So each three codons will represent an amino acid. And if you remember, we talked about the redundancies built into the genetic uh, code of RNA reading, right? There's multiple codes for each uh, MR or each uh, amino acid. Okay. So gen the genetic code is a set of rules giving the correspondence between nucleotide triplets, codons, and mRNA and amino acids and protein. Uh, RNA polymerase, an enzyme that links together the growing chain of RNA nucleotides during transcription uh, using DNA strand as a template. So RNA polymerase reads DNA uh, and fixes or makes RNA from that DNA. Okay. So this is the enzyme that goes from DNA to RNA, right? Uses DNA as a template, which means it's reading DNA to write down uh, the RNA, okay? And here is the redundancies that we talked about in uh, RNA, where we have multiple triplets, we'll give you uh, different amino acids, right? So here we have uh, three uracils will give you phenylalanine, two uracils and a cytosine will give you phenylalanine as well, uh, serine, here you have four different uh, codons, uh, triplets that will give you the same amino acid, tyrosines too, right? You have different uh, uh, codons will give you the same amino acid. This gives a level of protection and it also um, allows for errors that can occur, right? If, uh, if this actually gets switched out to a G or A or a C, you still get the same three name, right? You still get the same amino acid. Isoleucine, the same thing, right? This gets, this last amino acid or this uh, last RNA nucleotide gets changed out. You get the same amino acid, even if you get uh, something changed out. Okay. So there are uh, redundancies built in, right? And you should be able to look at an mRNA strand and read that mRNA strand uh, using this. And um, you should be able to uh, um, identify the amino acid based on this chart, okay? We always read from five prime to three prime. We talked about that a little bit, the five prime to three prime. Uh, it's going to be referring to the orientation of the RNA and it's gonna be, where is the structure? No, one second. all of that. So referring to uh, what carbon, um, let me see, where is the, yeah. So this would be the five prime end because of this carbon, and then the three prime end would be the other side, right? It, it's uh, talking about the orientation. One's facing uh, phosphate up, the other side is facing phosphate down that anti-parallel. Um, and the amino acid uh, um, sequence, again, is created uh, based on that, RNA, that uh, mRNA strand, and it reads from five prime to three prime. And we'll see that right now, okay. So, oops, a little cut off. For our, uh, 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 transcription, um, again, we have the initiation. We have RNA polymerase comes in uh, and binds to the DNA to make the protein, right? So there is a promoter sequence here. This promoter uh, recruits the uh, RNA polymerase to come and attach to the DNA, okay? Um, again, the promoter is just calling over the enzyme that's gonna make that RNA strand, okay? So here you have elongation or the start of 
um, the uh, the RNA or the mRNA, the enzyme will start, and you have uh, the growing uh, mRNA strand here. So again, RNA has is just a single strand. You don't have the two uh, sides to the mRNA. There's no double stranded uh, um, RNA um, inside the cell unless it's a virus. Okay, so. The single-stranded mRNA, again, it's going to be just one long set of nucleotides, uh, RNA nucleotides. That's going to be used to leave the uh, uh, nucleus in order to pl uh, plug into a ribosome. All right, so again, the elongation. So promoter, attachment of the enzyme, the elongation or creating of that uh, RNA strand. Once this enzyme hits a sequence called the terminator sequence or terminator DNA, this is going to stop uh, the, uh, the mRNA from working. And I just want to point something out uh, real quick. There are sequences that are stopped. So UAA, UAG, UGA, right? Um, these are going to be stop sequences. And these are going to be those terminator sequences that um, I'm talking about, okay? Once you hit one of those, uh, DNA polymerase or RNA polymerase knows to stop. RNA polymerase will say, okay, we're done with the, making the uh, mRNA. Uh, that is it. We're going to cut that off and that's going to go, uh, go ahead and leave the nucleus at that point to go plug into a ribosome. Okay. I want to point out another thing too. AUG is going to be your start codon. Okay. So this will be directly after the promoter sequence. Okay. This first uh, three uh, I mean, uh, this first three RNA strands or this first three RNA uh, nucleotides are always going to be methionine, okay? So this AUG is always going to give you methionine. Methionine is going to be the first amino acid of every protein, okay? This is the star universal start codon for, um, for an, uh, a protein, okay, for RNA or an amino acid sequence, okay? AUG is always the first uh, RNA uh, triplet that we see, AUG start, and then you have these uh, terminator sequences, UAA, UAG, and UGA, okay? and these will stop the amino acid from being elongated, okay, so we'll stop the, um, uh, this will be the end of that uh, 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 mRNA, okay, again, so you have uh, transcription and translation, transcription occurs inside of that nucleus, uh, again, transcription is just referring to the creation of that mRNA strand, okay? That's gonna leave the nucleus, so the mRNA. DNA to mRNA, right? You have RNA polymerase uh, reading the DNA to make the mRNA. The mRNA will then leave that nucleus outside of the cell. It will plug into a ribosome at, at, from the five prime N, and then it will make an amino acid, okay? All right, so initiation of transcription. Right, the starting uh, of transcription single uh, signal is a nucleotide sequence called a promoter sequence, which is located in the DNA at the beginning of the gene. Remember, methionine uh, is going to be the start amino acid. That first three amino acid sequences, AUG, right? So the promoter, then the first amino acid sequence, RNA polymerase comes in, attaches that promoter, uh, and then you have the AUG to start. Uh, for any gene, the promoter dictates which uh, uh, of the two DNA strands will be transcribed, right? So you either have one DNA side or the other. Remember, DNA is double-sided. You have either side will contain the promoter. Either side will be transcribed into that RNA. The RNA will then be turned into the uh, amino acid, okay, at, transla uh, at translation. RNA elongation during the second phase of transcription. Uh, elongation, the RNA grows longer. As RNA synthesis uh, uh, continues, the RNA strand peels away from, the, from its DNA template, allowing the two separate DNA strands to come back together in the region already transcribed. Okay, and that's just referring to the closing of that, those two pieces of DNA. Termination transcription. In the third phase uh, termination, the RNA polymerase reaches a special sequence of bases, right? The terminator sequence um, and again, the terminator sequence can be a, a UAA, UAG, or UGA. And again, this is going to be the stop uh, sequences found on the RNA, okay? Uh, and so the sequences are going to be a little bit different on DNA, the opposite. 
This sequence signals the end of the gene. At this point, the polymerase molecule detaches from the RNA molecule and the gene uh, and the DNA strand rejoin, okay? All right, so processing of eukaryotic, eukaryotic RNA. So again, this is translation. So this is going to be reading the RNA strand that is then going to be converted into amino acid, right? So there's a few different things that we need to know about. We have messenger RNA or mRNA, as I, as I was mentioning before. This is what's going to be leaving that nucleus, right? And this is going to be processed RNA that can pass through the nuclear envelope or the nuclear pore and then plug into a ribosome. So this is a... a uh, this is a type of ribonucleic acid that encodes genetic information from DNA and conveys it to a ribosome, right? So we talked about that DNA to RNA, then that RNA can then go and plug into a ribosome. So uh, the information is translated into an amino acid sequence. And those amino acid sequences I showed you before that are in the triplets will be used or read um, from this mRNA and in turn uh, uh, that will be used as a template to gather the amino acids, okay? Remember, methionine AUG is going to be that first RNA, uh, first amino acid, uh, that first sequence that you have in the mRNA, right? The AUG is always going to be first, okay, on the mRNA sequence. Intron and eukaryotes, a non-expressed, non-coding uh, portion of a gene that uh, is excised from our, an, an RNA transcript, okay? So I'll show you an image of what introns and exons are. Uh, exons and eukaryotes, a coding portion of a gene. So this will give you the gene. Uh, this will provide the, the genetic code, whereas introns are the things that are going to be cut out. Okay. Um, right. So RNA splicing, uh, RNA splicing, the removal of introns and joining of exons in a eukaryotic RNA. So think of introns are the things that are inside the nucleus that are going to stay inside the nucleus. I think of exons are things that are leaving the nucleus to be turned into proteins. Okay. Um, so again, exons are exiting, introns are inside, and they will always stay there. Okay, and we'll show you what introns and exons are in a minute. Um, so again, these exons are going to be forming uh, an mRNA molecule uh, with a continuous coding sequence uh, occurs before mRNA, mRNA leaves the nucleus, right? So exons are going to come together, whereas introns are going to be cut, cut out and then left inside of that nucleus, right? So here we have uh, a DNA a whole DNA strand that's gonna be used as a template, right? So uh, this is transcription. So we transcribe uh, from this DNA to create RNA. Um, we do have something called a cap. This cap allows the, this mRNA strand to leave uh, the nucleus, okay? So what we have are these introns here that are gonna be removed. These are pieces of RNA um, that eukaryotes have that are uh, non-coding pieces of, of, uh, of uh, RNA, okay? So this, these introns and extrons are very important in eukaryotes. Uh, bacteria do not have this. So bacteria will, if they have a gene and you're gonna make a protein from the gene, you're gonna, tran you're gonna transcribe this whole thing into an RNA and this can then plug right into a ribosome, right? And then you can make your proteins from that. Whereas, uh, transcription inside of, a, uh, of the nucleus, inside of a eukaryote, you transcribe this RNA strand, but then you have to chop pieces of this RNA out in order to make your coding sequence. And this coding sequence can then be used to make a protein, okay? Whereas bacteria, this whole thing will be red. There's nothing being cut out, okay? But eukaryotes, you need to have these introns spliced out. You need to join together the exons and then you can have that uh, whole mRNA leave the nuclear pore and plug into a ribosome, okay? Uh, bacteria are different, right? They don't have a nucleus. They don't have these introns that are cut out. They just have one big continuous RNA st uh, strand that is able to be transcribed and then translated in, uh, um, in a ribosome, okay? Right, but you care it's a little different. And there's a few different reasons why there's introns and exons. This uh, allows for a level of protection. This also allows for our bodies, um, especially when making uh, antibodies, to have uh, uh, allow for adaptive immunity. And then also it allows for multiple different uh, um, ways of, of uh, creating a protein, right? Because if you have these different exons in different areas, um, you can have one gene and it can make uh, variations of a protein, right? So this these pieces can be flip-flopped around 
either to create diversity or to create a different uh, um, amino or a different type of protein, right? You can take these, these little pieces and move them around. They can come together in different orientations and therefore you can get a different, uh, um, you can get a different protein. And this is common when we think of antibodies, right? So uh, we have one gene that has multiple different types of variations of an antibody, right? So think of your adaptive immunity. Uh, we have the ability to make antibodies for a very specific antigen or very specific target, right? So you have a bacteria, you have an infection, um, your body will eventually make an antibody against it, right? Think of this as when you uh, also for, for vaccines, right? You can be injected with some new or novel type of virus. Um, and and um, again, if you have the, the viral components that can initiate an immune response, right? That's what a vaccine essentially is. You get injected with some type of antigen or target that your body can recognize and your body can amount an immune response to it in the form of an antibody, okay? Um, the way you get the antibody to um, have a, a, an attachment to the new antigen or the new thing that's being that's infecting your body or potentially pro, uh, pro, uh, providing a risk to your body is you're able to manipulate that gene to have an, a specific attachment to that antigen. Okay, um, I know that's a little complex. Please, you know, ask questions if you have any. But essentially, this provides a variation in a eukaryotic cell where prokaryotes do not have this. Okay, well, they don't have. Uh, an immune system that is as complex as eukaryote because again, they're single celled organisms. They're not gonna make antibodies um, to protect themselves if there's only one cell. Whereas we're protecting a whole unit or protecting our whole bodies. We're able to make variations of single proteins in order to uh, accommodate each cell, okay? So that this is why we have the exons and introns, right? Okay, right, so mRNA, again, the introns, uh, the introns get cut out inside of the cell, the exons uh, leave, again, exit, think exons exiting, and then you have the protein being created. Okay, so structure of tRNA. So transfer RNA are a little bit different, right? Transfer RNA are the things that are gonna be attached to the amino acid sequence that are then gonna provide uh, the elongation of the amino acid, okay? And these are going to be uh, RNA molecules that form a three-dimensional uh, structure and they, they call them tRNA because they transfer an amino acid, right? So this tRNA has something called anticodon. And these anticodon are, are again, going to be able to read uh, and identify uh, the three, uh, redund the three uh, uh, amino acid sequences that are going to give that, that specific uh, amino acid, right? They can recognize these codons. They can bind. Uh, they have anticodon that can bind to the mRNA. And then again, you'll have the attachment of the amino acid here. So these tRNA are floating around in the cell cytoplasm outside of the nucleus. And once an RNA, mRNA plugs into a ribosome, uh, they will recruit these tRNA. So these tRNA will then travel over to these tRNA binding sites in a ribosome. So if you remember, ribosomes are found in the, the rough endoplasm reticulum. There's also free floating ribosomes inside of the cell in the cytoplasm, okay? So many times you'll see the endoplasmic reticulum spotted with a bunch of these uh, ribosomes. And again, that's very important because if you see, if you look where the, the uh, endoplasmic reticulum is, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, it's around the nucleus. That makes sense, right? If an mRNA is going to leave the nucleus, um, it's going to go through one of the pores and then attach to uh, these ribosomes that are found in the endoplasmic reticulum, okay? Um, and again, if they're located right by the envelope, it makes sense because that's where all the mRNA is uh, leaving anyway. Okay, so you have an A site, P site, and then you have this ejection site here. But the A site, again, is where you recruit the tRNA. The P site is where you have the uh, uh, reading or the uh, um, addition of the amino acid. And then once the amino acid is added, you have the ejection site where the tRNA is free to leave and then bind to another amino acid. Okay, so again, this is going to be, this is going to identify a codon. This is recruited by the ribosome. At the P site, you have the attachment of the amino acid, um, which will elongate that protein, okay? Okay, so you have the A site, it's gonna recruit, P site, the attachment of the amino acid on that uh, chain, and then um, you have the ejection site here, all right? All 
All right, so you have, uh, again, the mRNA uh, passing through. You have the anticodon um, being read by the tRNA, right? So boom, uh, you have at that P site, the addition of the, the, the amino acid, right? So you have the mRNA plugging in here as it's going through. It's red um, five prime. So you have, again, that five prime carbon, which you should kind of understand what those prime or the carbon is, but that phosphate side, okay, the phosphate first, right? And then the tail end is going to be the, the sugar. Um, so again, the tRNA will come in, uh, that, that P site, the A site will be the addition site, and then you have the ejection at the, the back, okay? But essentially, you have the, the RNA coming in from left, right? And then you have the tRNA coming in from the right. Boom, boom, adding, and then elongating that peptide, okay? Um, there are some good videos of this on YouTube, and you can find this uh, pretty much anywhere on YouTube. There, there's just, there, it's, it's good to watch, but again, um, this is uh, essentially just plugging in the, the RNA, the mRNA strand from the nucleus, plugging into a ribosome, tRNA comes in, and then you have the addition or the growing of these polypeptides, okay? So every single codon, every three codon will give you um, new, uh, a, new, a new amino acid, okay? All right, so you have a cap, you have the start of the genetic message, so um, this will be methionine, right? Every, the first amino acid. So this first amino acid is always going to be methionine. And then you have every triplet, every three uh, genetic code will be, um, after methionine will be in threes. And then you'll get um, new amino acid from each three, okay? <clears throat> All right, so initiation of translation. Again, methionine is always first. You have that star codon, AUG, and then that anticodon. So AUG and then UAC is the anticodon found on the tRNA, okay? So AUG, if you remember from that, uh, that uh, the codons that you read <clears throat> on that chart, AUG is always gonna be the first and it's always gonna be methionine after you have um, the addition of the next three, right? So the anticodon will be read here uh, by another tRNA um, and the, the tRNA will add the, the second amino acid to methionine. Uh, at the P site, okay? So here's kind of the elongation and how it works uh, in steps. So you can read through this and understand it. The anticodon of an incoming tRNA molecule uh, carries its amino acid, uh, pairs with the mRNA code at the A site of the ribosome. The polypeptide leaves the tRNA uh, in the P site. And this is the P site is where they attach um, the amino acid on the tRNA. Uh, in the A site. The ribosome creates a new peptide bond. Um, now the chain has one more amino acid. So remember, peptide bonds are created by dehydration synthesis reactions, which we talked about uh, in the previous couple of chapters. Okay, so dehydration synthesis reactions, also covalent bond. These are covalent bonds. The P site of the tRNA now leaves the ribosomes, uh, and the ribosome moves the remaining tRNA carrying the growing peptide to the P site. The mRNA and tRNA move as a unit. This movement brings into the A site, the next mRNA codon to be translated, and the process can start again with step one, okay? All right, so you have the cycle here. You have, again, the A site, the recruitment, and then you have the addition of the amino acid. Then the tRNA will transfer to the P site. You'll have the elongated peptide attached. And then once it's ready, the new codon is ready to come in. Uh, again, you have that covalent bond, that transfer of the amino acid, boom, the ejection of the amino acid, and this will then move to the P site, okay? And then the process starts over again until the terminator sequence is read or the stop codon is read. And remember, there's three different stop codons, okay? All right, termination. So elongation continues until a stop codon reaches a ribosome's A site. The stop codons UAA, UAG, and UGA. Remember the start codon is AUG, which is methionine, right? First amino acid is always methionine. Uh, so these stop codons do not code for amino acids, but instead the tell translation to stop the completed polypeptide, typically several hundred amino acids long, is freed and the ribosome splits back into its subunits. All right, and that is it.
for chapter 10. Any questions? Nope. All right, cool. We'll go into chapter 11 and 12. Okay. Um, we probably won't get through 12 today, but we should get through 11. I didn't, I don't think this is as long as. Okay. How genes are controlled. All right. So how and why genes are regulated. So gene regulation, the turning off and on of specific genes within a living organism, gene expression, the process whereby genetic information flows from gene to proteins, the flow of genetic information from the genotype to the phenotype. So DNA, uh, RNA to protein. Remember DNA and R, uh, the DNA, RNA to protein is that central dogma that we talked about in biology. Okay. Um, remember transcription, translation. I know we're going through a lot of genetics and a lot of genetic information. This is kind of a big picture of what this is, right? So I, I previous, the last two previous um, lectures have been very heavy on um, how this, this uh, information is, is performed or how this um, <clears throat> gene expression is done. Now we're getting into the why and why it's important. Okay. Um, but think of this uh, gene regulation and eukaryotes as, as very important, right? Because if you think about it, we talked about how all of our cells contain the information, the same information, whether it's your liver cells, you have uh, kidney cells, you have eye cells, you have cells that make up your skin or your mucous membranes, right? Um, you have a lot of different types of cells in your body. Um, but they all contain a nucleus, and that nucleus contains that genetic information. And that genetic information is the same uh, uh, in every single one of your cells, right? You can take cheek swabs, send it to 23andMe, and you can get your, gen gen uh, your gen genome checked. Um, and it, those same cheek cells would have the same genetic information as all of your cells in your body. Yet we have cells that make up our fingers, our bones, our bone marrow, our our organ systems, right? We have cells that make the base root of your teeth that allow your teeth to grow, your tongue, muscles. Um, there's so many different types of cells in your body, yet we have the same genetic information in every single one of your cells. So how are we able to differentiate the cells and these cells are able to make a, a, a multicellular organism and have very specific functions yet contain the same information? And gene regulation and gene expression is how this can occur, right? We're able to have one set of rules or one pamphlet of how to run life, yet we're able to pull different cells out of this information and have a functioning complex organism, right? We have cells that swim in our blood that protect against pathogens, right? We have white blood cells. We have Cells in our, in our blood that make up the majority of our blood, right? Our red cells actually don't even have nuclei, right? Our, our, if you didn't know this, your red cells or your blood actually doesn't have nuclei. They don't have a nucleus, right? They don't have genetic information. But how do we get that? We have a lot of different variations in our cell types that allow our bodies to function normally, that allow complex life to function normally. Uh, gene regulation is extremely important with that. Right? We need to have very specific rules that are followed for every single one of our cells. Okay. So, so patterns of gene expression in three types of human cells. So different types of cells express different combinations of genes. These specialized proteins whose genes are represented here uh, are an enzyme involved in glucose digestion, an antibody uh, which aids in fighting infection, insulin, a hormone made in the pancreas, and the oxygen transport protein hemoglobin which is expressed only in red blood cells, right? So here we have all of these different uh, characteristics of these cells. And again, each one of these cells contains uh, genetic inf the same genetic information, right? If they come from the same organism, they contain the same genetic, genetic information, right? These cells contain 23 homologous pairs, right? They have 46 uh, chromosomes, okay? 
right? You have 23 from your mom, 23 from your dad. You have 20, uh, tw uh, 23 homologous pairs, right? Uh, each cell is going to have those, that information from your mom and your dad, and each cell will uh, use that genetic information to make up its unique characteristics, right? They're reading and they're looking at the genome and the genetic information, and they can differentiate. And your body and your and organisms can do this, right? They can make uh, um, different cells from a single uh, 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 um, set of, of information, right? And that is really very important into how complex life forms and to how we can have, uh, um, you know, differences. And th this is why we don't have just single celled organisms throughout the world. We have, uh, you know, ourselves, which are multicellular, and we have huge elephants to huge whales to, uh, to tiny little multicellular organisms that can differentiate uh, based on their genome, okay? So gene regulation in bacteria is a little bit different, right? And it's a little more simplistic, right? So one thing we talked about previously before, transcription and translation of eukaryotes is a little more complex, right? You have the DNA inside of the nucleus. That DNA then gets transcribed into uh, our tra transcription and translation occurs separately. So transcription inside the nucleus. Then you have that uh, the exons and introns, right? Exons are uh, uh, tied together, and then they can leave the nucleus that way and plug into a ribosome. Well, bacteria are a little different. Transcription and translation occurs simultaneously. So in bacteria, transcription will occur, and right when that RNA is created, that RNA can then plug directly into a ribosome. So transcription and translation can actually occur at the same time. So as RNA polymerase is making the mRNA, that mRNA can plug directly into a ribosome, okay? So uh, uh, RNA polymerase is start, starting uh, making the DNA into RNA. And when that, that process does not even need to be completed before that mRNA can plug into a ribosome and that ribosome is making a protein, okay? So that occurs instantaneous in bacteria. You can also have multiple ribosomes that are attached to a single mRNA in bacteria. Multiple ribosomes from a single mRNA making multiple proteins from a not even finished mRNA, right? Whereas in eukaryotes, it's very different. It's very segregated, right? Transcription occurs inside the nucleus. Again, exons and intron processing, exons leave, and then they can go into a ribosome and make a protein. Bacteria, uh, much different uh, in terms of how that, that's performed. Everything happens at the same time. All right. So bacteria are single cell organisms that do not need to have uh, cell differentiation that multicellular organisms need, right? Sing bacteria are single cell. Um, there are a few cases where they do form a multicellular growth called a biofilm. Um, and they do show differential gene expression. This is actually where my research is. I, I studied biofilm formation and regulation of uh, g uh, bacterial gene regulation. So um, they don't need to uh, regulate their genes as much as a eukaryote in terms of how they, they manipulate their metabolism, things like that, um, and how they differentiate into different cell types. Bacteria do not have different cell types. They have one cell type, but they do have regulation, okay? Uh, Bacteria also do not have nuclei, so transcription and translation occur at the same time. Uh, again, that's what I was talking about previously. Operon, a unit uh, genetic regulation common in prokaryotes. It's a cluster of genes with related functions along with the promoter and an operate, op, operator uh, that control the transcription. And we'll see that right now, the operon, okay? So here we have the LAC operon for E. coli. So this is going to turn on in the presence of of uh, lactose, okay? So the LAC operon can be turned on because you have something here called a promoter. This promoter, um, lactose can be the, uh, help the promoter actually become stronger, right? The lactose can directly bind or initiate this promoter sequence to occur, right? This promoter sequence will recruit uh, uh, RNA polymerase. So this is RNA polymerase. It'll bind uh, to the promoter and then start the initial transcription of uh, the, the RNA from the DNA, right? So these are genes for lactose uh, uh, digestion, right? You need lactase in order to break down lactose. 
Lactose is a disaccharide, like I mentioned before when we talked about sugars. It's glucose and maltose together. Again, many humans don't have the ability to make lactase, uh, but E. coli definitely does. Okay, remember we talked about having uh, being lactose intolerant. People say they're they're allergic to lactose. In reality, what it is is you do not have this enzyme, these genes that code for that enzyme that can break down lactose. So what happens is you consume the sugar. That sugar does not get processed um, as it should. And when the sugar reaches your colon, where you have a lot of E. coli, E. coli definitely like lactose, okay? They have this specific set of genes that can actually break lactose down very rapidly and they can utilize the sugar. So when E. coli comes in contact with lactose um, and it's pure lactose that your body did not process, right? It's very high concentration of sugar that made it to your colon, which it shouldn't be there. This organism, E. coli, goes crazy and it processes it. It digests this lactose and it loves it, over, over uh, uh, replicates. And then you have an overgrowth of E. coli, which gives you diarrhea, okay? And you have the gas and the indigestion. Um, and again, this is just because you provided E. coli with a very concentrated amount of sugar from that milk or that ice cream or that cheese. Uh, and E. coli is just very happy to have it. And again, uh, really upsets your, uh, your bowel at that point. Uh, but that's, uh, again, I'm going off on a tangent there with E. coli and uh, lactose. But again, lact the lacopron is a prime example of uh, how uh, E. coli can regulate its genetic information, right? So DNA to RNA to protein, right? So again, this, uh, again, DNA polymerase will come in, make a specific, uh, uh, or RNA polymerase will come in and then attach. And then you have, um, again, the creation of these different genes in order to process that uh, specific milk sugar, lactose. Okay, so lactase uh, breaks down lactose and then E. coli can then utilize the sugars. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so again, here we have uh, the initiation. Lactose will come activate, uh, inactivate a repressor so this repressor will be bound to the genetic uh, code here, okay? The only way to stop or uh, to remove or allow this RNA polymerase to bind to the operon is to add lactose, okay? So lactose will remove this repressor here that allows RNA polymerase. Remember, RNA polymerase turns DNA into RNA that can then plug into a ribosome, right? So here we have a repressor that is bound to the DNA of bacteria. The only way that this gene can get turned on is if this repressor gets removed, right? A repressor is going to repress something. Uh, in, this, in this case, it's going to be this gene, okay? So in order to get this repressor off the genetic code, this, gene, this genetic information, lactose will come and bind and remove this repressor, right? This will uh, change the structure of the protein once lactose binds, the sugar binds to the repressor, and it will remove it from that, uh, um, that specific genetic information, allowing for RNA polymerase to bind, okay? Um, lactose can also enhance the promoter, right? If lactose can come and bind, if there's proteins here in the promoter that um, recruit DNA, RNA polymerase at a much higher level, um, you may or may not have the uh, expression or the recruitment of the RNA at a higher rate, okay? So again, the repressor uh, gets removed by the presence of lactose. Uh, RNA polymerase binds the promoter, and then you have mRNA being translated um, or transcribed, and then you can uh, have mRNA translated uh, directly after the creation of that, uh, um, that RNA strand, okay? So this mRNA will plug into a, a ribosome. This ribosome, again, will make the lactose enzyme that, that are used to break down lactose, okay? So gene regulation bacteria, promoter, a specific nucleotide sequence in DNA that's located at the start of a gene that is the binding site for RNA polymerase. And uh, the place, uh, oops, typo, the place where uh, RNA polymerase binds. Operator, a prokaryotic DNA, uh, um, a sequence of nucleotides near the start of an operon uh, to which an active repressor can attach. The binding of a repressor prevents RNA polymerase from attaching to the promoter and transcribing the genes of the operon. A repressor, this is a protein that blocks transcription of a gene or an operon, okay? 
Um, so make sure you understand this, okay? So this is a repressor and this stops RNA polymerase from working, uh, stops RNA polymerase from binding to this genetic code to, uh, to make the mRNA from uh, these genes here, okay? Um, the only way to remove the repressor is to have the specific uh, molecule that'll bind to this active site that'll remove that protein, okay? Here it's lactose, but it can be a lot of different things depending on what types of enzyme you're going to be making, right? Um, once lactose is present, the repressor can then be removed. This promoter sequence can then attract the, uh, the uh, RNA polymerase. Again, the, the RNA polymerase will bind to the promoter, start uh, um, transcribing uh, the, uh, M uh, the mRNA from the DNA strand once this repressor is removed, this mRNA can then plug into a ribosome and make your enzymes that are needed to break down lactose, okay? Uh, so again, these are the definitions of those proteins there, all right? Um, so gene expression pipeline, uh, again, this is gonna be a little bit different in eukaryotes. So each valve in the pipeline represents a stage at which the pathway from a gene to functioning protein can be regulated, right? Turn off or on or sped up depending on what or what that cell needs. Throughout this discussion, we will use a miniature version of this figure to keep track of the stages as they're discussed, right? You have a chromosome, which is gonna have all your genetic code and information. Um, you have this portion of uh, unmethylated DNA that can then be transcribed. You have a gene of interest, right? You have transcription translation of that gene, transcription first, where the exons are cut out and then turned into an mRNA. Uh, you have a cap that allows for the exit of the mRNA, okay? This can then um, leave the cell on uh, either plug into a ribosome or get broken down, okay? There's a few different things that can occur for in regulation in terms of uh, um, how to prevent a protein from being overmade and how, um, or preventing a protein or uh, mRNA from being read in the cytoplasm, okay? So there's multiple areas of regulation depending on uh, the cell type and what proteins need to be created, okay? Uh, you can have uh, the chromosome be blocked off or methylated, right? Depending on what this chromosome or what this gene is, uh, genes can be turned off and on, right? Uh, in initially upon, um, so if you think about the, the, think about a child developing in the womb, right? There needs to be differentiation genes that are turned on and then turned off once you are born, right? Or once that child develops to a certain place, okay? You don't, this is why you don't have overgrowth of fingers, overgrowth of, uh, of, of legs. You don't have multiple kidneys. You don't have multiple heads and brains, right? Sometimes that can occur. Right? There can be issues with the, the, the genetic code or mutations that allow for the overgrowth or the, differentiate, uh, the inappropriate differentiation of cells. But again, this regulation process can be very finicky. Okay? Um, and there's multiple levels of protection. So every now and then something can occur where you do have conjoined twins, you do have issues with development. But again, um, the cell does really well at regulating the genes and regulating the proteins needed uh, by the cell, okay? Um, so you do have something called uh, chromosome inactivation. Um, so this is uh, X chromosome inactivation. So you have something called a bar body, okay? And this is uh, in all females, right? Um, even uh, even uh, um, uh, humans, okay? You have something called a bar body and, and females are what we call a mosaic, a genetic mosaic. So what happens is uh, since females have two X chromosomes, uh, they need to turn off the genes from one of those X chromosomes and it's random, right? Uh, you get one X from your mom, one X from your dad, right? Um, and so this is how you can have a calico cat. Um, um, so you can have one, uh, uh, one gene that's turned off and one gene that's turned on, uh, depending on what your body decides to select. And this is common for all females, right? Uh, you have uh, one uh, uh, X chromosome that'll be a bar body. A bar body is something that 
uh, or a bar body chromosome is, is a chromosome that's not able to be transcribed, or you do not get any of your genetic information from that uh, specific uh, um, chromosome. And again, it's random in the cell, right? This occurs early on in development. Um, your cells will turn off one from your mom or, or one from your dad. And, it's, and it depends and it varies between each cell type, okay? Uh, and again, this is how you can have variations in phenotypes in those female cats, right? But same thing with humans. Um, as females, you again have two, two chromosomes, but you only need one. So randomly, uh, one of those chromosomes will be inactivated inside of that cell. And again, this regulation is very important because again, if you have two chromosomes producing double the amount of protein, right? Um, you could have issues, right? Um, and again, males don't have to worry about this because we only have one X chromosome, right? If we get a bad X chromosome, we're screwed. And this, uh, if you did that lab that was assigned, you would know that the sex-linked chromosomes or the sex-linked uh, sex inherited chromosomes or diseases are uh, provide issues for males typically, right? Males typically do have the condition if they're given the inappropriate X, right? The bad X that has the recessive trait that has the... Uh, um, the uh, the negative uh, phenotype, right? Uh, uh, right. Males are typically more colorblind more often than females, right? Because that's a sex link trait. Um, um, so that and then again, this is because females have uh, two chromosomes, two X chromosomes that are donated, one from mom, one from dad. Whereas males only get a Y from dad, and we only get an X from our mom. Okay, so we get a bad chromosome. We only have the bad chromosome to work with. Therefore, you know we're. If we're going to be colorblind, we're going to be colorblind. We're screwed, okay? Whereas females will have this bar body. So you can have one or the other that's turned off. Um, and then you have a variation of the in-between mom and dad with the X, okay? All right, the initiation transcription. So it's trans, uh, transcription factor in a eukaryotic cell protein that functions in initiation or regulation transcription. Uh, transcription factors bind to DNA or to other proteins that bind to DNA. Enhancer, a eukaryotic DNA sequence that helps stimulate the transcription of a gene and some dis, uh, distance from it. An enhancer functions by means of, of a transcription factor called an activator, okay? So we talked about activators. They can be molecules uh, in the cell that are processed, right? Um, we talked about negative and positive feedback loops, um, right, where some other protein in that chain of events can go back and turn off or activate a metabolic pathway, right? And these are gonna be those sequences. You might have a protein that's bound to the, to the DNA that recruits RNA polymerase. You might have uh, a protein that, uh, that stops, uh, like a silencer, uh, that, that genetic information if too much of that product is being made, right? Um, so it just depends. A eukaryotic DNA sequence that inhibits a stage, uh, or silencer is a eukaryotic DNA sequence that inhibits the start of a gene uh, transcription may act uh, analogously to an enhancer binding a repressor, right? So silencer is again, that negative feedback, uh, right? Where if you make something in the product, that product will go back and stop that gene, right? If you have enough product, you don't want to keep making that product. So this will actually go back and silence that specific gene of interest. The activator is a little bit different, a protein that switches on a gene, right? The activator for the LAC, the LAC-Z gene is lactose. Right, the activator will go um, and turn off uh, the lac the activator again will be lactose again removing the uh, the the uh, silencer. Okay, um, I think we'll stop here. Yeah, that's fine. We'll stop there and we'll talk about the lab. So we do have um, the lab. It's going to be, uh, you'll have questions today. So you'll just have one lab. And it will be about genetics. You should have enough information from today to do it. Um, And it's still kind of go off of, uh, oh wait, I don't think this is it.
But yeah, you'll have enough information to do this. Okay. So you'll have, um, actually, I'm not 100% sure. It should be linked to your Canvas shell already. So yeah, go ahead and get that. Um, that assignment done. Let me make sure that I have the right one. Um, oh yeah, it should be the family tree one. You should be able to, uh, um, yeah. So it'll be like a family tree and you'll look for, um, yeah, you'll look at the difference. Uh, you know, mom and dad are gonna be donating. So it's gonna be what we talked about um, with Mendelian genetics and, and uh, uh, the different, um, rules of inheritance, what, who's affected, who's not, what's sex linked, what's uh, um, recessive or non-recessive, what's dominant. So you'll go through a family tree and kind of understand what's, uh, what's going on inside the cell. I'm going to double check to make sure that I put, um, put that one in there, but it, it's kind of building off of the Mendelian genetics. And that's going to be very important on the next exam. I'm going to ask a lot of questions about that. Um, so if you have any questions, please let me know and email me. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the exam on Wednesday as well. I know I'm planning on having it today, but I got a little hung up on uh, Zoom. So we'll run through the questions. Um, also finish grading the exams, uh, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, so a little behind there, but, but I'll, I'll get it done. So I do apologize for that. And you do have an exam. Um, I'm thinking of pushing it back again, because we're a little behind from that week. Uh, uh, but you, sh you were going to have uh, an exam this week. But again, we're behind a week. So I'll probably push it back to week eight, uh, just because um, you need to have a quiz. And then um, yeah, we have to get through chapter 11 and 12. So I might push it back to the end of the week, or I might push it back to the beginning of next week. I haven't decided yet. Uh, but I want to be, I want to have a, a review session. Um, and uh, the last chapter that will be on exam two, I think will be 11. So 12 will be pushed on to uh, um, exam three. Okay. So exam two, again, either the end of the week, or we will have um, the exam just on, uh, I'll sign it on Monday, probably. And you'll have a couple of days during the week to get it finished. Because I had a, I had a, so I think, yeah, I think that's what's going to happen. I'll finish 12, we'll review, and then um, then I'll, I'll assign the, the exam. And depending on what people want to do, if, if you feel more comfortable having the weekend to study, we can, have, we can have the exam on Monday. And then I will just lecture normal 13 and 14 on, uh, on, week, uh, on the next week. Um, so we're caught up because I feel like we're a little behind here. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, we're a little behind. So I'll just lecture through that exam period. And if you want to have that extra time over the weekend, I'll allow it, but I'm still going to lecture Monday and Wednesday next week. You're not going to have a free day. So um, either we take the exam this week at the end, or um, we can push it back to Monday, but uh, I'm going to lecture on Monday. So you're still going to have an exam. You're still going to have a lecture. Um, you're still going to have an assignment, uh, assignments due. So um, just keep that in mind. You will, you will, we can push it back, but I'm not going to stop the information. You're still going to, you're still going to be, uh, uh, we're still going to take exam three on week 10. Okay. So you'll have a very small amount of time to really, um, yeah, I get that. All right. Uh, any questions? I know there's only two of you today, so feel free to ask anything you need. Um, if not, uh, we're good for today. No, and then I'm going to be giving you all information on uh, your projects, but I'll I'll will talk more about that later. Um, oh, cool, all good, cool, cool Orlando. So yeah, again, those projects you'll have a presentation, a small little presentation for me. Um, but again, I'll, we have a little time, so I'll be giving you more information probably in the next week or so about the paper and then um, the the little presentation that you're going to be giving me. Okay.